Thank you, Dr. Kane. So I really appreciate the honor of being here and talking about sexual dysfunction and IBD because this is the real world of our care. This is collaborative care. Not all of us can be experts. And so uh, this is the OBGYN perspective of it. And as you'll see, I won't be alone in management as well. So I have no financial disclosures, but the one disclaimer that I have is in the original wording in the uh, brochure. It says I'm going to talk about male and female sexual dysfunction. Given my clinical expertise and our time limitations, I'm really going to focus on female sexual dysfunction alone. And I'd like to acknowledge a couple of important people whose expertise really informed the content of this talk. One is, I believe, here in the audience, Dr. Sonia Friedman, who's at Partners in Boston and does a lot of clinical work around sexual dysfunction and IBD. And the other is Jessica Sanders, who's a researcher at the University of Utah who researches sexual dysfunction and contraception. And these two co-authored a recent uh, review article on this topic, and so much of this content belongs to them. So I'd like to talk briefly about the sexual response cycle in women, review the epidemiology of sexual disorders in the general population and in IBD patients, define classifications of sexual dysfunction, and then discuss the evaluation and management of disorders. So first I'd like to remind you about how complex the female sexual response cycle really is. And many of us haven't really seen this since probably med school. But when we first started doing research on sexual dysfunction in the 1960s, this was really a model that was based as a mirror off the male sexual response. So it was much more linear, which isn't how women experience sexual response. And so over time, this has been modified to include many biopsychosocial responses, such as pleasure, satisfaction, relationship status, cultural or religious beliefs. It also takes into account that women may not enter into sexual acts just because of desire, like men do. They might enter into it for other reasons, but still gain pleasure from that. Another reason why we don't have a lot of great li literature and research on sexual dysfunction is because women don't have the same objective measure as men. Often, vaginal lubrication has been used as the measure that is equivalent to male erection. But what we found is it's highly vari variable, both between women and within an individual woman, and subject to stress, relationship issues, et cetera. And so a lot of the research has changed from these objective findings over the years and is now more focused on sexual satisfaction. What is satisfying to that woman in that encounter? Now, many studies have really shown that there's a high prevalence of sexual dysfunction in women in this country, as high as 30 to 40 percent. But really, when you ask women if they're distressed by these findings, only about 10% actually say that whatever sexual dysfunction they have, whether it's low libido or lack of orgasm, is really distressing to them. And so it's only about 10% of women who are actually distressed by their sexual issues. And it's often related to stress and relationship issues. Now, few women in this country actually seek care for sexual dysfunction, partly because it's a highly stigmatized topic, and they don't know who to go to. And in the current surveys that we have that we try to do more universal screening in high-risk populations with, they're not always very specific to that population, such as in IBD. And they're often reflective of male sexuality. And so we overestimate the prevalence. Now, this is a graph showing the prevalence of sexual dysfunction based upon age. And as you can see, it increases throughout the childbearing years and really peaks around menopause and then tapers down again. And this isn't because older women aren't having sex, but just because their expectations might be different and they're not as distressed by any limitations. And mirroring that graph, you can see that many lifestyle events, such as pregnancy or menopause, are linked with sexual dysfunction. And this is why, as an OBGYN, it's so much easier for me to talk to my patients about this, because it's just part of my review of systems when a patient's coming in around pregnancy, postpartum, breastfeeding issues, menopause issues. And so patients are often expecting to get those questions in my office, where they may not be in yours. And so trying to figure out how to fit that into your care and meet their educational needs is an, an important patient outcome, but also different for each individual. 
Additionally, it's not all pregnancy or menopause, and it's not all IBD. There are a lot of other risk factors for sexual dysfunction, some of which are actually comorbid with IBD, such as depression or anxiety or emotional stress, but others can happen throughout a woman's life and be independent of their disease or her reproductive issues. And so it's important to look at the whole picture of the woman if she's coming in with these complaints and not just focus on her IBD or its treatment. So why am I up here talking to you today? And that's really the point of this lecture, is that patients want this information. IBD is commonly diagnosed during reproductive years. This is when adolescents or young adults are really identifying themselves as sexual beings. They're entering into potentially their first sexual relationships with this disease. Many are considering childbearing. And so for them, these are really important quality of life issues, and they want information on it, and they want it from you. But unfortunately, if there's limited research in the general population, there's even less research in the IBD world. And especially since there's such a spectrum of the disease and its treatments, it's really hard to give anticipatory guidance to our patients. But we know that there is a high prevalence in this population, regardless of the limitations of the studies that have been done. And we know that it's correlated with disease activity. And patients say that they want this information around the time of diagnosis or as early as possible. And now I'm a clinician too, and I recognize that this is sometimes hard to do when you're seeing a patient and you're talking to her about her chronic disease and high-risk medications. But at the same time, these are the questions that patients actually are waiting to hear from you. And the majority of them are not going to ask. They're waiting for provider-driven information. Now, many things with IBD, its treatments, disease activity, as we talked about, are associated with sexual dysfunction. Medications, depression, hypogonadism, body image issues around surgery or some of the symptoms of IBD. And so these might be times as a patient is experiencing these that you touch back on the sexual function issues again, even if you have previously. And for patients who have undergone surgery or will undergo surgery, talking to her about how a woman who has an extensive pelvic dissection could potentially have some pelvic nerve injury that could lead to vaginal dryness or sensation changes. There could be anatomic changes, too. For a patient who has a total colectomy, the vagina tilts more posteriorly, and secretions can pool, causing discharge that's bothersome, or dyspareunia that she didn't experience before. And so, talking to her about communication with her partner and position changes, um, extra lubrication, these are all important aspects to allow her to recover and regain her sexuality after surgery. So how do we talk to patients in a way that's not burdensome to you and is the right time for her so that she can actually disclose these issues? And I'm not standing up here pretending I have an answer for you, but I recognize that everyone is going to be different in their comfort level and everyone's going to be different in their clinical setting. But no matter how you do it in your office, the patients want it done and they want it done in a very open, caring dialogue. This is not a conversation to have with your hand on the doorknob on your way out the door, because it's really complex for a lot of patients and can be very sensitive. Also, we need to really avoid any preconceptions about what is normal. I have a lot of chronic pelvic pain patients and IBD patients who may never have penetrative intercourse because they physically can't. But that doesn't preclude them from have a, having a satisfying sexual life. And so that's really important to set those expectations and goals with the patient. Also use gender neutral language. We know from large population level studies that women have very fluid sexuality, especially younger women. So a woman who might initially identify as lesbian to you may eventually be in a heterosexual relationship or vice versa. And so avoid preconceived notions or uh, assuming the gender of the partner. And also remember that we are a collaborative care environment. And so some women are not gonna feel comfortable disclosing these issues to a male provider and the same goes for men to women. And so use your partners, use your amazing nurse practitioner who might already be doing some education on other issues, and really maybe probe them to ask these questions in a safer environment that's less uh, time pressured as your appointments might be. And I'd like to say that we have a great screening tool where you can hand it to your patients and check the box and then refer them. But unfortunately, we don't have an IBD-specific tool that's really been validated and used at a population level yet. And so this is hopefully an area of future research that's ongoing. And so Dr. Freeman has uh, taught me and many of her trainees as well to ask patients in a very normative way about this. Start by just telling the patient, IBD and its management can sometimes interfere with a woman's sexual life. So that way the woman knows that you're thinking about it, it happens to patients, you hear this all the time, and you're not outside the norm by bringing it up in the conversation. 
and then be more specific about what symptoms she has, such as fear of passing stool, if she has a stoma and has inhibitions related to that. You can really tailor these questions that, that you can then decide where to refer the patient. Now, sexual disorders have been a psychiatric condition for a long time, and in the DSM-5, these were consolidated into three separate disorders. The first being female sexual interest or arousal disorder, the second female orgasmic disorder, and the third is genital pelvic pain or penetration disorder. Now, all of these have a time stamp on them. They have to be occurring for approximately six months, um, greater than 75% of activity having reduced orgasm for the second one. But an important thing to remember is that these often overlap. When I see a patient, she's often coming in for pelvic pain, but that pelvic pain may be precluding her sexual interest or arousal, which then leads to fewer orgasms. And so often we try to deal with the third issue, which is the genital pelvic pain or penetration disorder first, before really tackling the first two. Now this is the broad differential for genital pelvic pain. And when I see these patients, I always start with knowing that they need a longer visit booked. Because I'm going to spend some time talking to them about some of their psychological issues around those fears, phobias, potentially gain some history of abuse from them. And that's really going to direct my ability to even examine that patient on that day. And then we talk about what type of pain she's having. Is it burning just from wearing her clothing? Is she having more stabbing pain? If it's with intercourse, is it with insertion, with penetration? Does the pain persist beyond intercourse? Can she insert a tampon? And these are important questions that also direct how I'm going to be able to examine her. When I do the exam, I start with just inspecting exteriorly. I look for atrophy, dystrophy, signs of infection, previous scarring, fissures, fistulas, anything that might be a, an obvious sign of where this pain is coming from. If there is anything on exam or anything in the history that increases my suspicion, we might do a vulvar biopsy. We might do screening for STDs or for vaginitis. We then move on to what's called the Q-tip test, which some of you may remember from your OB-GYN rotations, where we just use one of the sterile Q-tips and start either as the provider or if the patient's very anxious, I'll let her direct this test and start by just gently touching on the thigh and then moving more medially, touching the vulva, touching the perineum, trying to elicit where that pain is. Is it more diffuse? Is it one specific location? And that way we can really direct the therapy to that area. We then look for resting vaginal tone, both with voluntary contraction and relaxation, look for any pelvic organ prolapse. And then if I can do a bimanual exam, I'm palpating for the pelvic muscles, assessing for spasm or contraction. I'm feeling the uterosacral ligaments of the uterus, assessing for nodularity or fixed retroversion of the uterus that might be signs of pelvic adhesions or endometriosis. And then also feeling the bladder and urethra to make sure that it's really not the urinary tract that's the cause of her problems. And so as you can imagine, the outcomes of this are broad depending what's found on exam. But regardless of what the finding is, before you can really manage her sexual symptoms, she needs definitive treatment for her gynecologic disorder. And often for our IBD patients, this also means sending her back to you for discussion of medication management if she's still having active disease or other treatment options. Because I can't really deal with her sexual health issues as well if she still has chronic pelvic inflammation. And then usually we bring the partner in because this has to be an, impro an important part of the communication for her. We talk about the effects of chronic pain on the sexual response cycle. So what this means is the patient's been having pain, it hurts when she has sex, so she doesn't have sex, and then when she does have sex, she's fearful it's going to hurt, so this inhibits her ability to enjoy it or gain any satisfaction. And so it becomes this vicious cycle that can really affect relationships as well. And so with the partner, we come to an agreement. We remove whatever the painful sexual experience this is for whatever amount of time this patient needs. And so if intercourse is painful, we take that off the table and say, we still want you to communicate, to have intimacy, to have sexual acts, but you cannot have penetrative intercourse because that's only going to interfere with her healing during this process. We also talk to her about avoiding any other irritants, potentially tampons. We refer to different therapies, which I'll get to in the next slides. For some patients who have more of a localized area, we can sometimes consider a topical anesthetic, such as lidocaine jelly for that area before intercourse, and that can help with some of her inhibitions and some of her pain management. There have been a number of medications that have been tried, such as gabapentin, TCA, injections. Um, none of them really bear out uh, to be the 
fix all for many of these problems. And so they're an option, but they're definitely not our first choice. But where we do have a lot of great evidence is in pelvic floor physical therapy. So it's really important for you to find in your community whoever this pelvic floor physical therapist is that has experience and an interest in women's health because they're the person that's gonna make the difference for this patient. So either it's reaching out to your OBGYN colleagues and finding out if they have a pelvic pain clinic that they work with a therapist. Our urogynecologists often work with therapists to help with incontinence issues or pain issues. And so these are the people who can really work with your patients, provide biofeedback, provide myofascial release if that's the issue. Some of our patients experience incontinence, fecal or uh, urinary, and so they can help with those issues as well. The other important part is consideration of psychotherapy. And a lot of this really depends on what comes up in that history with the patient, and also what you often see when you bring the partner in about what their level of communication is. And so we talk to them and explain the sexual response cycle, the different things in the life cycle that can affect her uh, sexual function. And then we try to figure out where the patient is most vulnerable and what's going to help them. Now, there are very few centers throughout this country that have certified sex therapists. And often these uh, therapists are cash only. And so it's not accessible for many of our patients. But if you have them, use them. This is their expertise if they're somebody that the patient can access. But there are other great psychologists who can do mindfulness-based therapy to manage chronic pain, cognitive behavioral therapy to manage some maladaptive thoughts and catastrophizing anxiety, these patients who think it's going to hurt and become very anxious and then can't engage in sex. Some of these therapists will recommend hormonal therapy along with the therapy, but it's not necessarily first line again. But the different hormonal therapies that have been tried, and unfortunately we don't have that one pill for erectile dysfunction in the female sexual health uh, literature, but we use hormonal contraception often to manage menstrual related pain issues, bleeding issues, sometimes IBD related issues. For patients who have vaginal atrophy, we can use topical estrogen, both in the perimenopausal period and also in patients who are breastfeeding and, and recently postpartum, this can become an issue. Often we use systemic hormone replacement if they're having more uh, systemic menopausal issues as well. There have been several studies on use of testosterone and uh, bioidentical hormones. And again, we don't have great research supporting their use. Probably the most promising one is intravaginal testosterone, but still that's a rarely used uh, option for patients. And then many of you have probably heard about the newly approved uh, drug for female sexual dysfunction. And unfortunately, the evidence supporting its use is still very limited, and it's very expensive for many of our patients, so it's still not the one drug fixes all. And so this is the algorithm that Dr. Friedman and I had developed on uh, managing these issues with our patients. And really at the top of the line is collaborative care between GYN and GI to make sure that we manage active GYN issues and IBD issues before we really start going down the tree to manage their sexual dysfunction. And both of us should independently be evaluating for psychologic components to this because the patient may di disclose abuse or some other depression uh, or anxiety issues to one of us but not the other. And so that's why communication is so important. Once we've managed those issues and optimized her medications, then we can start working on the issues around sexual dysfunction, referring to pelvic floor PT or to psychology. And so in summary, female sexual response is really multifaceted, and these are long individualized conversations. And so make sure that however you're going to approach this with your patients, you do so in a supportive environment where you have time to address this. And there is no ideal screening tool for it, and so each person needs to have an individualized conversation, and hopefully future research will be developing that. And then again, we need to really individualize care, set some goals with the patient. What does she want to achieve? What is she going to see as a satisfying sexual experience, even if she can't have some aspect of that happen? And so don't focus on dysfunctions they feel like they're somehow failing in their therapy. And then again, this is a multidisciplinary approach. Find the OBGYN who has the interest in your department, find the pelvic floor physical therapist and psychology options in your community so we can really meet the needs of our patients and improve their quality of life. Thank you.